So, uh, good evening everyone. I'm Anthony from uh, Team Eco Polytechnic and I will now present subject number seven, Half-Life Sparkle. So, um, this is the statement of the problem. The idea is that when you apply an angle grinder on uh, regular steel, it produces sparks, of course, uh, and these sparks sometimes split, as we can see in this picture, creating like little forks that we can see with the naked eye. The question is to uh, study why does this split occur and to find some properties of the distribution of the length that they uh, travel before splitting. Um, so this is the experimental setup we used to study this. So here on the right you can see a grinder which is used to produce, to produce the, the sparks. And on the left there is a high speed camera that is filming at about uh, 1000 frames per second uh, in front of a black background in order to see the sparks. So um, we use also different steels in order to assess uh, the importance of the different parameters of the, the steel, mainly a carbon concentration. Um, it is also important to notice that other metal uh, like aluminium or copper, some other metal don't even produce sparks, so we did not study them. Uh, so this is the kind of uh, video we can obtain with, uh, with low, carbon, uh, low carbon steel. Uh, we can see much uh, explosion for now, but there is um, enough physics to discuss for a few minutes before uh, tackling explosion. So uh, the first thing we can see uh, on the video is the, basically the trajectory of sparks. So um, let's talk about different, the, the two different forces that act on them. There's the drag and, and weight. In fact, it is quite easy to write the Newton's law for um, the trajectory of sparks. And by doing that, uh, we can see that it, the, the whole trajectory only depends on two parameters in an idealized case, the radius and initial velocity of the spark. So if we uh, track the trajectories of the, the spark, we can assess these two variables by fitting uh, the solution of this equation. So uh, we did this. Here you can see on the right that uh, in blue we measured, um, we measured the trajectory of sparks. So this is a spatial plot. Uh, each point is a given uh, time, uh, it is the position of spark at a given time. And it, in orange, this is fitting that we did uh, by variating uh, the, the radius and initial velocity. Uh, so we did this experiment for different uh, forces applied on the grinder in order to assess the importance of this parameter. And we did it by, uh, simply by using a kind of balance and mass uh, in order to, uh, to put a constant force on the grinder. So uh, this is the kind of things, so we did it for the different forces. And uh, as a result, uh, there is this table. So we can see that the radius of spark uh, don't really depend on the force we are applied. We are always around uh, 50 micrometers. And also the initial velocity is, is quite constant. And in fact, it's approximately a, a little bit less than the uh, tangential speed on the angle rider, which is quite convincing. So these values will uh, be used thereafter as um, orders of magnitude for these two parameters. Uh, now let's consider a second thing on the physics of sparks is the cooling. It's very important, of course, because sparks are, can be called sparks only when they are um, glowing, so only when they are hot, and there is a cooling process occurring. Uh, the most important um, uh, phenomena which is cooling the spark is uh, the convective cooling. So uh, with little hypothesis, we can write Newton's law of cooling uh, with a coefficient here, uh, which is about 2,000 watts per meter uh, square per Kelvin. And so this uh, can be solved, this e differential equation can be solved very easily to get uh, this result uh, with a characteristic time of about 50 uh, microseconds, uh, milliseconds. But this order of magnitude is um, quite, th this uh, characteristic time is quite big. And in fact, you know, it's quite, it's quite, uh, it is not enough. In fact, if we take a minimal temperature at which the sparks are visible by our camera to be 1,000 Kelvin, and uh, if we observe uh, sparks living up to 0.2 seconds, which we did, uh, we can get back their initial temperature, and it is about uh, 10,000 Kelvin, which is quite high, which means that there might be another phenomenon which keeps the spark uh, glowing, um, so which keeps the sparks hot. And this phenomenon might be oxidation. Uh, so there is also oxidation occurring uh, at the same time as the cooling. Uh, just to give a little bit more uh, of, of orders of magnitude, if we take the, a basic uh, oxidation of re reaction of oxidation for, uh, for the sparks, 
uh, we can calculate that there is enough energy in a single spark to heat it adiabatically by about 10,000 Kelvin. So it is just the good order of magnitude. And also the characteristic time of oxidation may be the characteristic time of diffusion, which is about 8 milliseconds. So is also a, a low enough uh, time in order to, for this phenomenon to have an effect. Uh, but the most convincing thing, I, I think, is an experiment. So if we do um, the grinding experiment using uh, not oxygen but helium, uh, we can see that there are no sparks. So here at the beginning uh, from this green tube on the right, there is helium uh, pumped and there are no sparks. And when we take it back, uh, oxygen can flow inside the box in which we are doing the experiment. And then those sparks are glowing again. So this is, uh, I think, the most convincing proof that uh, oxidation is very important in the physics of spark. Uh, so now, we tackled uh, the most import some important phenomenon uh, of the physics of sparks. Let's go back to the splitting. Uh, so we can observe it if we increase the carbon concentration of sparks. So here you can see on this video there are various, sp various sparks which are uh, exploding uh, <coughs> everywhere. Uh, and well, before uh, giving an explanation, let's make another observation. So this is the distribution of the distance um, uh, traveled by the sparks uh, from the grinder, so it is in logarithmic scale uh, for the ordinates, so we can see that it aligns pretty well, so it, the, the distribution might be an exponential one. And also, if we take over it the overall distribution of sparks at a, at a given time, we can see that these two distributions are quite the same. It is even more impressive for the um, 100 Newton experiment because there are more uh, data. And with, uh, with uh, uncertainties, we, we also see that the two distributions are, are like the same. So having these this two distributions the same means that the explosion of spark is random. And by random, I mean uh, if we take a picture on which there are all the sparks, and we say on the next millisecond there will be a spark which is exploding, you cannot say which one will, be, will it be. And so to explain the explosion of spark, we have to introduce some randomness and also carbon. Because we've seen before that without uh, a great uh, concentration of carbon, there are no explosion. Uh, the best way we found to explain it is by using uh, the microstructures of iron, uh, of, uh, yes, of steel. steel. Uh, in fact, steel is not homogeneous. It is uh, composed of uh, iron and carbon. And there are two phases. The main uh, phase is the matrix is ferrite. Ferrite is uh, alpha iron, which is quite pure. And in this ferrite matrix, there are grains of perlite. Perlite is a compound of cementite and ferrite. In cementite is uh, a carbon precipitate. So in fact, we've seen before that there is oxidation occurring inside the spark. When this oxidation reaches a grain of cementite, it can produce carbon dioxide according to, according to this reaction. And then carbon dioxide, in our hypothesis, could build up inside a cementite grain and then create an internal pressure which makes the spark explode. And in fact, this is really explosion we observe uh, with a high-speed camera. So it makes it a quite convincing explanation. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we've just explained what is the best hypothesis we think uh, make the spark explode. And um, we also... Uh, speak a little bit about the physics of spark to see what could influence the distance before they split. So there is uh, the force applied, which make them uh, glow longer, so uh, seeable longer, so which make the um, distance longer. And also uh, various phenomena, like uh, the trajectory and, and so on. And we also uh, measured the distribution of the, the sparks uh, of the before explosion. So uh, thank you for listening. And Yes, there are questions. Oh, that's okay. Good. So you said that the randomness came from the uh, microscopic structure of uh, your steel. Have you tried?